Welcome back to the podcast, Unbinding the Bible. This is a by-the-book episode, a conversation with Justin Bailey. And on the podcast today, I've invited Justin to come on and talk to us about his recent book, Reimagining Apologetics, The Beauty of Faith in a Secular Age. And what I've really appreciated about Justin's book in particular is what his title suggests, and it is Reimagining apologetics. And on this conversation today, you're going to hear all about the imagination and how our engaging people at both our imaginative level as well as their own, grasping not just truth of the Christian faith, but also its goodness and its beauty really is the heart of what we need to be doing when we talk about the Christian faith today. And Justin will talk to us a little bit about traditional apologetics and how that has a time and a place and yet what reimagining apologetics might offer the world in our day and in our age. And then he takes two particular authors that he deems over the past several centuries who have done this well in their particular secular ages and the responses they've gotten both within and outside the Christian community. And so I'm excited to offer this to you. Justin is a wonderful thinker, very clear, incredibly insightful Um, deep and yet can bring it to a level that just everybody can follow and understand. And so it's gotten me excited just talking with him about wanting to go out and to buy the books and read the books that he's suggested. Um, As many of you know, just in listening to this podcast, I've always been one with an active and vivid imagination and I'm excited to, for you to be able to listen into what Justin has to say. So just to give you a little background, Justin is an assistant professor of theology at Dort University. He works at the intersection of theology, culture, and ministry, and his written work has appeared in the online journal In All Things, as well as Christian Scholars Review and the International Journal of Public Theology. He is an ordained minister in the Christian Reformed Church, and he has served as a pastor in Filipino-American, Korean-American, and Caucasian American settings. And I am very excited just to share with you about a 30-minute conversation that Justin and I have about his book, Reimagining Apologetics, The Beauty of Faith in a Secular Age. So Justin, I'm really glad to have you on the show with us. Thanks for agreeing to be here. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be on with you, Joshua. Um, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself um, and anything you think would be relevant to sort of kind of your life trajectory and what led you um, to the writing of this book? Sure. Yeah, I am a professor at Dort University, which is in Sioux Center, Iowa, right up in the northwest corner. It is a Christian liberal arts college, and I teach in the theology department here. Uh, prior to coming to Dort, I served as a pastor in several different congregations, Um, first in the immigrant church in Filipino and Korean American churches, and then in uh, Caucasian American church in Los Angeles. And uh, this book really came out of the questions and the quest that I was on as a pastor um, and now as a professor seeking to serve students, uh, emerging adults who uh, were struggling with faith And I was quite adept in apologetics in the traditional sense, but I was really um, soon convinced as I began engaging in that with with young people, especially, that there was something that was disconnected, something that I was missing. And this book really reflects the um, some of the outcomes of that quest. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So you said you were really you know, well-versed in apologetics. And I mean, I, I have read your book um, cover to cover, so I know the ins and outs of it. But for those who haven't yet read your book, um, could you talk with us a little bit about how your book relates with apologetics and what you mean by maybe the, you know, more traditional apologetics and then what you are, um, you know, what you're grasping after in like reimagining, as you call it, apologetics. Sure. Yeah, so it's a, yeah, it's important to make sure that we have the same thing in mind when we say traditional apologetics. Uh, apologetics has been around as long as the church has been around. Apologetics is the conversation that becomes necessary 
uh, whenever there are objections to the Christian faith, anytime Christianity comes in to encounter with a world outside itself, there are questions, there are obstacles to belief. And the apologetics has dealt with how do we respond to those objections. Um, in contemporary times, really in the last couple hundred years, traditional apologetics has come to be uh, thought of primarily as concerned with the truth of the Christian faith. So we are defending the truth of Christian beliefs, uh, perhaps in clashes with secular culture, or uh, maybe in, internally within the church, help uh, we're bolstering the belief of the faithful. And I want to say at the beginning, I don't have significant problems with that way of doing apologetics. I think it's important and um, and continue to practice uh, many of those traditional um, ways of doing apologetics, answering the questions that people are asking. Uh, but, you know, there is a contemporary suspicion towards that way of doing apologetics. In fact, I taught a course on apologetics at a seminary, and I was surprised that I was needing to defend the legitimacy of apologetics to the students. And one student said to me, if apologetics is about making arguments and hitting unbelievers over the head with truth, then I want nothing to do with it. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so I began to realize that, um, you know, just especially in light of the way that some of the younger generation sees apologetics um, and, and also the way it's been practiced, um, that perhaps we need a more robust approach. And so what I'm trying to do in my book um, is to ask the question of what it would look like to do apologetics if the imagination and not just the intellect is important when it comes to, to faith? And what would it look like to do apologetics in a way that takes that seriously if defending the truth is only a part of apologetics? Uh, so that's what I'm trying to do is to perhaps, um, if you could use this language, add um, some right brain imagination to left brain intellect um, in the way that we approach um, the practice of apologetics. Yeah, well, it, it was it was so exciting when I when I dove in even to the introduction because I resonated so much with what you were writing. Um, I didn't know for years if it was my personality or if I was just a defective Christian, <laughs> but I never could get a handle on the classical or traditional apologetics. I always felt like I'm not an argumentative person. I feel like the nature of the ways you you know quote unquote defend the faith are almost inviting you trying to logically, um, you know, persuade, or, or as you wrote in your book, I think we're, we're not just heads on a stick, or maybe you were quoting someone when you, when you wrote that, I don't remember, but, but yeah, realizing that we're so much more than just thinking heads. Um, we, we actually have emotion and imagination as you, as you talk about, which I really liked. Um, now you you defined what you meant by imagination. I just made a note here on page eighty five. So let me read just a section. I'd like you to talk about this actually, um, and I'll I'll set you up with a specific question. But um, on page eighty five in your chapter three, getting a grip, reaching out, getting a grip on the imagination. You said that imagining is a strategic, intentional, and embodied activity that suspends actuality. For the sake of reality. Hmm. Um, in imagining, we aim to accomplish something we could not accomplish any other way. Um, we can imagine things that do not exist, but our ultimate goal is to grasp the world more securely. Um, first of all, that's that's astounding. I loved that. But I, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about yeah, your your understanding of imagination. We've got somebody listening in. It's like, well, I mean, we're dealing with truth, right? Jesus was a real person. The Christian sure. faith is a real thing. What what are what are you getting at when you talk about the imagination? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, let me first start by saying what I don't mean by the imagination. Um, we tend to think of the imagination as um, escapist, perhaps. So we use the imagination to escape reality. I go into a movie theater and I just want to turn off my brain. Um, or something like that, you know, or daydreaming, you know, or we may think of imagination as infantile, something that only kids do. You tell your kids, oh, use your imagination, you know, but something that we, we grow out of as we get older. Uh, but the truth is, is one of the reasons why we tell our kids to use their imaginations is because the imagination is one of the greatest things about being human. It's the faculty of possibility. Um, and you have to have a faculty of possibility if you're going to hope, for example, tomorrow could be better than today. 
So imagination is that faculty that can explore um, possibilities of, of what the world would be like if Christian faith is true um, without necessarily quite believing that the Christian faith is true. So there is a, a problem that, that we have when, we, when it comes to commending the faith to somebody, and it's the problem that there are some things that you can really only understand about faith from the inside, from a position of commitment. And from the outside, it looks strange. A lot of the things we do and believe as Christians look strange from the outside. And yet from the inside, it, it totally makes sense. And so that's, that's a difficulty if you're going to try to help somebody who's on the outside looking in, trying to understand faith, trying to believe uh, what it would feel like to be on the inside. Uh, and so the imagination is actually a gift that God has given to us that gives us the capacity to imagine what it would be like if faith were true. Uh, and so there's this very much the sense that, that I'm hoping that through engaging the imagination, you can create a hunger for it to be true. There's um, a thinker, a philosopher named Blaise Pascal, and he said this several hundred years ago. He said that um, we need to make people wish that it were true and then show that it is. So mm -hmm. I guess what I'm trying to say is that it's not that truth is unimportant. Of course, truth is important. Um, the reality of the resurrection is the thing that grounds all of our hopes, and it makes our hopes more than wishful thinking. The fact that Jesus really came out of the tomb on the third day bodily, and that he is returning one day to make things, uh, to make all things new. Uh, so there is that concrete, historical, uh, visceral reality um, that the imagination is rooted in. Uh, but for somebody who's struggling with that, somebody who um, doesn't know if it's true, creating imaginative engagement gives us a chance to make somebody think, well, what would be the implications of that? What, what would the world be like? How would the world open up with meaning? How would um, relationships be different if Jesus was really raised from the dead? Uh, it allows people to suspend the actual to explore the possible. And uh, we first you know, so it's not the truth is not important. It's this, it, it doesn't come first. Uh, what comes first is creating a hunger or a taste for the truth, uh, for the goodness and the beauty of faith before uh, we can, before somebody honestly cares enough uh, about about it so that they would seek a uh, a demonstration of the truth. Yeah, and to hear you write so repeatedly about goodness and beauty as well, and I, and I, I guess I, I sense the need for us to constantly hold those three together and not try to dismember them or, you know, well, this is true, whether or not you think it's beautiful and, and you know, keep keeping them together. Um, I am not overly familiar. I have not read any um, George MacDonald or Marilyn Robinson uh, myself, and we're going to get into that in just a second. I'd like you to talk about both of them, but I have read a little bit of C.S. Lewis, and I wonder, he wrote an article or an essay, maybe Meditation in a Tool Shed. Are you familiar with yeah. that? Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. So in my mind, your book fit really well there because he's talking about what you can observe about the sunbeam coming through a tool exactly. shed from the yeah. outside. But when you get into the inside and, and I wonder for him, it seems like a lot of his apologetics writings, his mere Christianity or the problem of pain are kind of assessing things from the outside. And then his Narnia series and mm. out of the silent planet and the space trilogy are sort of his approach from the inside where, yeah, you just assume these realities and then you show the kind of world that would be created. Is that similar to what you're advocating for? Yeah, that's a wonderful example. And I think Lewis is um, one of the reasons why Lewis has so much enduring value uh, for us is because uh, of the way he holds intellect and imagination together. And uh, he is a wonderful model of, you know, inside Narnia, we feel uh, what it's like to live in an enchanted world, uh, which is uh, in some sense, beset by evil, but a world in which we believe that good will triumph. And and that's one of the reasons, you know, I, I grew up, um, it, it occurred to me that as I was growing up, I, I was I was in love with fairy tales and mythology and comic books. And then as I grew older, I began to think, well, that that's just trivial. That's childish. That's the food of an immature mind. In fact, you know, I grew up reading the King James Version and, uh, you know, did, often the King James Version calls imagining vain so the vain imagination um and uh and yet even as i doubled down on truth and as i you know as i grew older and began to began to really care about truth and 
and want to defend it, the imagination never really lost its hold on me. And I realized that the most formative authors were not the ones who just restated the truth, but the ones who actually engaged my imagination, like C.S. Lewis. And then I also realized that scripture itself is given to us in imaginative language. You have poetry and parable and apocalyptic, which require you to develop a biblical imagination. And so, yes, we do have vain imaginings and that, that we ought not to follow. Uh, but the, the way to, um, to deal with vain imagination is to develop a vividly biblical imagination so that we see the world through the lens of the gospel and through the lens of, uh, of the story of creation and fall and redemption and restoration. And that's what Lewis really does so well in, in the Narnia books, especially. Yeah, well, I'm really glad you said we just need a more robust imagination. It's not that we get rid of it. Um, and and that that brought a lot of hope to me personally, because I a lot of times I live in my head, as you might say, but I'm always just imagining things and love Lewis and and want, I'll be honest with you, Justin, I, I want to get into Marilyn Robinson now and some George MacDonald because you you set up the synopsis of their books so well. It made me, I got online and started researching, where can I get this for a good price? Can I get a used copy? And does my library have it? And, and all these things. So just to set our readers up, your, your, or our listeners, not our readers, um, the, the second half of your book, you, you did a deep dive. You went into both George MacDonald and Marilyn Robinson and um, some of their novels and how they are, in your mind, doing great um, imaginative apologetics through their writings. So can you, um, can you speak a little bit to, um, why did you choose both of these writers? Maybe a little bit about, you know, their, their generation and what they were writing into as far as their society. And then, um, a little bit about what they bring to the surface that would help us engaging our imagination. Sure. Yeah. So when I started this project, I was reading a lot of philosophy and theology and thinking about the psychology of how belief works and the connection of belief and imagination. Uh, but the more that I did that, the more I became convinced, you know, who are the people who are the most skilled when it comes to imagination? It's not necessarily those who study the imagination, but those who actually so to speak, traffic in the imagination. So poets and writers and artists, um, fairy tale tellers, you know, the, they're the ones who we need to learn from uh, when it comes to engaging the imagination. So that, that's what I was, that's sort of the goal of the second half of the book is to actually learn from some grounded Christian writers, uh, novelists um, about how to do this. And so I came to McDonald through Lewis. Uh, Lewis famously wrote that George McDonald baptized his imagination um, through, through one of his works. And this was long before his actual conversion, which is really interesting. So he said, you know, years before I talked to my friends, Tolkien and, 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 and was convinced of the truth of Christianity. Um, George MacDonald's writings baptized my imagination and gave me a taste for the goodness, a taste for holiness. He says in his, um, in his biography, surprised by, surprised by joy. And so MacDonald was, uh, writing in the 19th century during the Victorian era, and this is the era in the English-speaking world in which it is becoming publicly acceptable to be an atheist. And you have all of these deconversion stories of people who are walking away from the Christian faith. And, um, and you have the rise of, of Darwinism, and you have the rise of higher criticism with respect to Scripture, questioning the historicity and the inspiration of the Bible. And so there, there was traditional apologetics that was going on during this time. Uh, but it was interesting that MacDonald, the way that he engaged that was different than uh, the way that more traditional apologists did. He really tried to engage it on the level of the imagination. Now, he was not afraid to answer the arguments that were being made by atheists. But what he really tried to do instead was to paint a beautiful picture of faith and what it looked like to live a life in relationship with Jesus Christ. And, um, you know, he really is, um, you know, he wrote fairy tales, he wrote children's stories, which by the way, is where I would begin if you're, if you're wanting to read is to read his fairy tales and his children's stories. But he also wrote what's called realistic fiction in which you have these characters who are struggling with faith and struggling with belief. And, um, he sort of takes us on the journey with them, uh, through faith and doubt and shows us, uh, of the, the beauty and power of the Christian faith to, um, to hold people who doubt. So that's McDonald. Uh, the next thing was that I began to think, well, is there anybody who's still doing that sort of thing uh, now, today, 
And what I meant is a writer who is writing from a place of faith, but who has earned a wide hearing from secular audiences. And so that led me to Marilyn Robinson, who wrote the novel Gilead, which is about an elderly preacher living in Iowa and uh, looking at the world through these eyes that see God's grace um, everywhere. And I was drawn to this book because I read a review of her work in the New York Times, of all places, Mm -hmm. in which the reviewer said, I'm an atheist, but she helps me imagine what it would be like to see a world that is fallen, yet deeply loved by its creator. And so that's what what oh, led wow. me to what led me what led me to uh, Robinson because that book you know won the Pulitzer Prize you know when when it was written in two thousand four, and um, yeah and, and so both of these authors have had an incredible impact on me. It doesn't mean that I necessarily agree with everything they say, and if you read my book, you know that. But they do both share this common approach that takes the imagination very seriously when it comes to commending commending the faith. And so those are my those are my two in depth models. Well, yeah, and it was it was great. Like I said, I I hadn't read either one. I am familiar with McDonald's. Um, is it Fantasties? Is yeah. that that the Fantasties. one? Yeah, and I think Lewis speaks about that too. Um, and then I had heard of Gilead, but have not yet read it. So, so yeah, you said that George McDonald has also written some children's books. What what are some of the names of those? Yeah. Uh, so Princess and the Goblin is probably his most famous one. And Princess and Curdy is the follow up to that. Uh, that is, uh, you know, I, I read it to my children, you know, uh, when they were when they were four and six years old. So, I mean, it's very accessible for um, for a child. Also, there's collections, The Light Princess. That's another one. Uh, there's a fairy tale that he wrote called The Golden Key, which is just beautiful. Uh, and so that's where I would start. I would start with the Curdy books, the Princess and the Goblin, Princess and Curdy, and and go from there. Fantasties is the book that Lewis said baptized his imagination. Uh, some people find it really hard uh, to read because it's sort of this um, this fever dream, you know. And so Lewis um, obviously, you know, is working with a lot more horse intellectual horsepower and imaginative <laughs> horsepower than the rest of us. So I don't always recommend starting with Fantasties, but um, I would start with the fairy tales and the children's books, and then uh, go on to Fantasties uh, from there. And if you're interested specifically, you know, the, the books I talk about most in my book are uh, a trilogy of books called the Wingfold Trilogy. So Thomas Wingfold Curate is the first book. And that book is a novel. It's a realistic novel, so not a fairy tale, but it is about um, a pastor, a minister who realizes that he doesn't really believe. And the book tells about his struggle with doubt and then how he comes back to faith and then is able to help others who are struggling with faith. Uh, And so in books two and three, Thomas Wingfold becomes a guide, so to speak, for other people who are doubting. Um, And in one case, in book two, an atheist named Paul Faber, who's a doctor. And then in book three, a bookbinder um, named named Richard. So that's that's the series that I would read if you're specifically interested in uh, the ones that I talk about in my book. Yeah, no, that's really helpful because I think someone who studied this and who who sees, hey, these would be of value to us today. Um, I've learned so much from just, yeah, fiction, even if it's similar to real life or if it's totally different, like something like Fantasties or, um, you know, just a, a, a regular fairy tale, if you will. Um, maybe, Justin, there, there might be somebody listening who who thinks, Hey, I mean, apologetics has been around for a long time. It was good enough for people in the past. Like, why do we need to sort of rethink this? And I, and I think in your book, you sp- speak about our time today as this age of authenticity and that being um, more and more important, if I if I understood you correctly. So h- how would you kind of sum up, here's how our time is somewhat different from times past and why those in our time today may may need a a vigorous engagement of the imagination. Sure. Yeah, that's a great question and it's a question that could have a very very long answer. Um, you know, first of all just just to say that apologetics has always changed based on um the questions that were being asked and the way that the questions were being asked. So, um, you know, in the in the beginning of the church, uh, apologetics sounded like this. Uh, you might not think that what we are saying is true, but we've done nothing worthy of death. You know, so so that was what apologetics looked like in the beginning. Is it was yep. an argument not to not be killed, 
um, you know, from Justin Martyr and people like that. And um, yeah, so uh, apologetics must change uh, in light of the questions that are being asked and the way that those questions are being asked, whatever the situation that the church finds itself in, we want to start and meet people where they are. Uh, rather than just insisting that they come over to where we are. You know, we want to answer the questions they're asking and the way they're asking them. And so what I, I try to say in the book is that we live in a time in which people really, um, the way that they even navigate faith and doubt is not so much intellectually. Um, there is instead this felt sense that people have that something resonates or doesn't resonate uh, with them. And we can either, you know, condemn that and say, well, you're actually thinking about this completely wrong, or we could meet people where they are and their desire for authenticity and their desire for a world that makes sense, a faith that, that makes sense and resonates with them and ask the question, well, what is it that's not resonating? Um, and, uh, and, and what is perhaps the image of faith or the picture of faith that they have that's keeping them from being able to see why this would even be better or more beautiful if it was true? So I'll, I'll tell you a story to sort of illustrate this. I tell it in the end of my book, but uh, my wife works um, for a company and she had a coworker who asked her, well, she was a friend, I guess. She felt comfortable to ask her this question, um, which the question was this, why are you raising your children with faith rather than allowing them to choose for themselves what they want to believe? Now, think about that question for a second. I, I often, when I speak to audiences, I ask them to, to think or to write down what they would say, because our initial response is quite defensive, isn't it? Right to to to, to that idea that we might actually be hurting or harming our children by raising them with faith um, rather than without faith. But to engage somebody in their desire for authenticity would mean to take a step back and say, okay, let's think about the way that she, this coworker, is thinking about faith. The frame that she has of faith is that faith is narrow and constrictive and opposed to freedom. And it's sort of this cage that you're putting on your children. So what my wife said in the moment, and this was before I had written my book, so I can't even take credit for this. She said, faith is the most liberating thing we've ever experienced. And we couldn't imagine a greater gift to give to our children. Wow. And her friend said, wow, I have never thought of that before and wanted to know more. Right. So what happened in that moment, that, that's what imaginative apologetics or a reimagined apologetic would look like. It would get underneath the question to say, what is the picture that this person has of faith and how can I paint a more beautiful picture? Because once that friend now resonated with that picture and said, wow, but actually, what if it was possible that the freedom that I'm looking for is not found in doing whatever I want, but actually in this story that, that God is telling, that it's found inside faith, not outside faith, um, so that this would actually be a gift to receive rather than a cage to, to choose to enter, um, and, then, and then a gift to give. So that's what it looks like, I think, to engage people in an age of authenticity, is that people feel their way into faith. Um, and so again, we can object to the fact that people place too much of an emphasis on feeling. That's true. They place too much emphasis on feeling. Uh, but how do you engage that? How do you engage somebody who's putting too much emphasis on feeling? Well, you can either tell them they're wrong and they shouldn't place so much emphasis on feeling, which that might work. Or you can begin by meeting them where they are and painting a more beautiful picture and then saying, well, the other thing about this picture, it's not just beautiful, but it also is good and true. Um, and as you said, holding those three things together. Wow, that was beautiful. That that answer right there was worth all the time to listen to this episode. So <laughs> goodness, thank you. Yeah, that that just really sums it up to me and, and really captures it well. Um, what a gift we could be to the world by mm. holding out something that's truly good and beautiful as as well as true. And so just I know our, our time is wrapping up. And so I just want to ask you one last question if I could. Um, I'm a pastor in a, in a local church myself, and I know several people who listen to the podcast are in churches too, but where do you see, um, or if you do, but where do you see the need in the church today the most, um, from what you've written here in your book? And you, you may mm. even repeat something you've already said, but I, I always like to see how, how is what we're reading ultimately, you know, going to be in service to what the church is trying to do with the kingdom. Sure. That's a great question. 
you know, I think that I want to say that you're already using your imagination and um, the struggle is not to use your imagination or not use your imagination, but is your imagination being shaped by the gospel? Is it being shaped by fear and by anxiety um, and by worry, or is it being shaped by God's better story of creation, fall, redemption, restoration? You know, I think about, you know, you're asleep at night and you hear a noise in your house and how immediately you can think of the worst case scenario, right? Of that noise of somebody breaking in and hurting your family or something like that. See, the imagination already works naturally. And part of being a Christian and part of being a leader is not just um, discipling the intellect, but the imagination. So that when we look at the world around us, we are not um, beholden to fear um, and responding to it in fear. And I think that's one of the things about the imagination that I find so compelling is that it allows us to have this um, patient, non-anxious presence in the world. Because if the world belongs to God, uh, then we can start anywhere. We can start wherever people are, and we can engage them knowing that God will show up um, in um, even in our, our hopes and our fears and our longings and our imaginings. And what God offers us in Scripture, what Jesus offers us, is a new story and a new identity that is not rooted in fear and all the things that our culture tells us to fear and to worry about, but that is rooted in this new creation that, that God is bringing. And, um, and that's what my hope would be um, as people read this book. I, I, I call this an apologetics of hope. Um, and the hope is not rooted in the human person at all. It's rooted in, in God and in God's desire to reveal himself to creation uh, through scripture, uh, through Christ, um, through general revelation, uh, and that God has not abandoned his creation to corruption. And if that's the case, then we don't have to be afraid. Yeah, no, that's really, that's really, really true. Yeah, Justin, thank you so much for taking a little bit of time just to talk with us about your book. I, I'm definitely going to put a link in our show notes for people to find your book. Um, and if they want to find you, I mean, just to follow you online, I don't know if you have a social media presence or where would you direct people who might want to follow a little bit more about what you're doing and saying? Yeah, thanks. I have a website, pjustin.com, P, and then my name, justin.com. And then I also am on Twitter and Facebook. So my Twitter handle is at J Ariel Bailey, A R I E L B A I L E Y. And um, and I'm also on on Facebook under the name Justin Ariel Bailey. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate this. Really enjoyed your book. Just uh, sparked a lot of new thoughts in mine. And who knows, I may be into some McDonald and Robinson in the next several months. Uh, well, then my work here is done. There it is. Yeah, that's right. You set us up and pushed us, pushed us forward. So anyways, thank you so much for, for talking. It's been a pleasure and I uh, hope you have a great weekend. Yeah. Thank you, Joshua. Thank you for reading the book and thank you for taking it seriously. Great. All right. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. What a great conversation that was with Justin Bailey. I know I say this a lot on the By the Book episodes, but if you even got a fraction of what I got out of that conversation, then it was a huge success. So these are so much fun for me, and I know lots of you tune in specifically to the buy the book episodes some of you those are the only episodes you listen to and so i want to make them as good as i can just for you as the listener please be on the lookout over the next several months i have a stack of books in my office that i'm working through have another interview lined up in in the next week one in several weeks after that and then another one several weeks after that and so i'll begin to be releasing these periodically throughout the podcast so be looking for those also leave me a rating or a review on whatever podcast app you choose to tune into unbinding the bible and tell a friend tell a family member tell somebody in your church pull out just one or two episodes that meant a lot to you share it with a friend and text them and say hey this is what i got out of it this is what jesus is doing through this podcast in my life i wanted to share it with you because you mean a lot to me or something like that that would be a creative and fun way to engage your friends to engage family and it might be easier to have a stranger saying something than something you would like to say but aren't exactly sure how to do it 
they can hate me if they don't like what was just being just being shared. So I'm appreciative of all of you. Thank you for continuing to tune in and we'll see you next time. Have a great week.